happier and happier. And part of that reason is that I feel that I'm doing the thing that I most want to do, and I think that I, I've got better at it, actually, because I think the, the last book was my favourite in the series, so that was a, the, the best way to end. The eldest daughter of Peter and Anne, Jo Rowling, showed her imaginative powers early, inventing fantasy stories as a child to entertain her young sister. She studied in Paris, then worked for Amnesty International. It was during this time that inspiration hit, and she started work on the first Harry Potter novel. After the failure of a brief marriage, she ended up in Edinburgh with her baby daughter Jessica. Money was short, and she was diagnosed with depression. But despite that, she continued to work on the novel, often writing in cafes. In 1995, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was finally complete. Twelve rejections later, Barry Cunningham of Bloomsbury Books agreed to publish it after his eight-year-old daughter read the first chapter and demanded more. However, Barry was worried that boys may be put off by a female author, so he suggested a pseudonym and J.K. Rowling was born. Only six years later, a first edition copy of the novel had a starting price of £8,000 at an auction at Christie's. Generally, it's just the Harry Potter books that we've Christie's have been selling recently. Um, it is, I think I'm right in saying, the first modern children's book that we've sold. We normally concentrate on much earlier, up to 18th, 19th century children's books. So it is, it is a phenomenon for us. Back in 1997, the phenomenon was only just beginning. The Philosopher's Stone won a Nestle Smarties Book Prize then the prestigious British Book Award for Children's Book of the Year. It also began its journey up the bestseller list. The second book, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, was released a year later. JK won the Smarties Award again. She also sold the film rights to Warner Brothers for a seven-figure sum. Conditions of the sale included an all-British cast and a stipulation that Coca-Cola, which won the rights to tie their product to the films, donate $18 million to the charity Reading is Fundamental. JK was also involved in the scripting process and Chris Columbus was taken on to direct. The first film was such a huge success that he was invited back for the Chamber of Secrets. I feel very excited about it because I think it's a, uh, I think the film is better. I think the, the performances of the kids are so much better this time around. I think the visual effects are way beyond where they were the first time around. I think we just spent more time on them. So you'll see things in this film that you didn't see in the first film. And it's a much more exciting film. It's faster paced, it's funnier, it's a little darker, scarier and edgier. The magic of the world JK had created transferred exceptionally well to the big screen. Daniel Radcliffe as Harry Potter was amazed at the overwhelming public response to the films. Oh, it's so exciting. What's it like when you get used to it now? No, you never get used to this. It's fantastic, though. It's absolutely brilliant. Oh. Were you very excited about today, and did you expect it to be this big? I, I, I didn't expect it to be this big, no, not at all. I think it's absolutely... It's just unbelievable. It's so much fun. Daniel, tell me what it was like. What was your favourite moment on the set? Um... I think one of my favourite moments was doing all the parcel term scenes. It was really fun, like, you know, it was a complete different language and it was, it was hard, but it was a lot of fun at the same time. As director, it was Chris's job to bring to life all the fantastical elements of Harry's world, like the flying car. Well, the car was great. I think what happened in those situations, the car actually existed on a stage. It was on hydraulics. Uh, about 25 feet in the air, and it could do 360 degrees and 90 degrees up or down, and the kids felt like they were really in the car. Couple that with the fact that we had a real whomping willow hitting the car, and it added a sense of reality to the whole procedure. The third novel in the series was released in late 1999. Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban saw children and adults lining up and counting down the seconds until they could get their hands on the new book. The novel won the Smarties Award for a third time and the inaugural Whitbread Children's Book of the Year Award. It quickly climbed bestseller lists. However, its popularity proved a problem in some circles. While librarians and teachers praised the series, 
saying it heralded a return to reading for many children, there were also calls for the books to be banned. Some Christian groups claimed the books glorified the occult and encouraged rebellion. JK was relaxed about the controversy. People have an obvious right not to read my books. We all have a right to protect our children from anything we think will hurt them. I personally don't think at all that I'm, I'm hurting children. At the release of the film version in 2004, she was feeling much more comfortable with her newfound superstar status and the pressures from fans and the media. I should say that probably three was the best writing experience I ever had. Of the, of the five books that are published, writing Azkaban was the easiest, and in some ways I think that shows, because I was at a, in a very comfortable place when I wrote three. Um, immediate financial worries were over, um, and press attention wasn't yet by any means excessive. So, you know, I, 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 I had less pressure on me during the writing of three. The film version of The Prisoner of Azkaban was directed by Alfonso Curran, and while authors can often be disappointed with big screen adaptations of their work, JK had no such regrets. No one who's read the book is going to be at all disappointed. He has, he has taken the essentials. I think I'd be very surprised if most people didn't find their favourite parts of the book in that film. And, but he's, 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 he's just, there's a unity about the film, there's a consistency about its tone and its feeling that's um, just very, very enjoyable for me. And it's Alfonso's version of my world, and I, I, you know, it's his, it's, it's, it's his baby. The fourth book, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, was released simultaneously in America and in Britain in July 2000 and shattered sales records. American fans bought 3 million copies in the first 24 hours. One lucky girl was given a copy ahead of time, as a friend of her father's found it in a bookstore, but everywhere else the strict pre-publishing secrecy was maintained. That same year, J.K. was named Author of the Year at the British Book Awards. The film of the fourth book wouldn't see a release until five years later in 2005. At the Goblet of Fire premiere, Emma Watson, who plays Hermione, noted that the films were changing as the characters grew up. I mean, it is a, it is a scarier film. It's, it's darker, it's much more of a thriller than it ever has been before. But at the same time, I think that he's also managed to pull off the funniest film yet. There's a lot of humour in it, so balance it out. The first chapter of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix appeared in 20 German magazines a full month before the official publication to raise money for the homeless. In London, 4,000 children attended a reading in the Royal Albert Hall, with the webcast being to millions. JK also answered questions from her fans. If I could have any power, power, I would have the power of invisibility. And this is a little bit sad, but I probably would sneak off to a cafe and write all day. But in 2003, there were other things taking up her time. Uh, right at this point, I'm not getting a lot of sleep because I just had a baby, so this is all slightly surreal. But tonight I get to have a drink for the first time in a long time, I'm, and I may have several drinks after this. Once this is over, I think I'll put it. At 900 pages, The Phoenix was the longest Harry book to date. The three-year break since Goblet of Fire raised some suspicions that the author was suffering from writer's block. JK admitted that she had felt the pressure and had even contemplated breaking her own arm to get out of writing. Book number six, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, was released worldwide mid-July 2005. As usual, the launch was heavily stage-managed. Secrecy was paramount, even for the book illustrator. Apart from J.K. Rowling, I think there's only about two people in the country who've read the book so far. Uh, I've been given a few snippets of information just to help me with the cover. And I'm glad I don't know more because uh, the responsibility of that I don't think I could handle. The publishers were ready for what they anticipated would be booming business. The Harry Potter phenomenon is bigger than ever. Scholastic has printed 10.8 million copies, filling over 600 trucks which are on their way to retailers. And those retailers across the country are planning over 5,000 midnight parties for the fans. And the fans, 
They are counting down till 12.01 a.m. on July 16th. In Canada, a bookshop inadvertently released the book early, and a small number was bought by the public. The book's Canadian publisher subsequently won a court order to prevent the lucky customers from spilling the beans and spoiling the plot for the millions of readers who had to wait a few more days to get their copy. In New York and cities all around the world, fans lined up for hours to be the first to get their hands on the new Harry Potter book. Many of them dressed for the occasion. This is going to be the biggest selling book in the history of book selling. And at Barnes & Noble, we already have over one million pre-orders for this book. It's unbelievable. In Scotland, J.K. thrilled a group of children with a personal reading at midnight in an 11th century castle. The children had won a competition to report on the book launch to their local newspapers. The penultimate book in the series broke all sales records, selling 9 million copies in the first 24 hours. At a charity reading in 2006 with fellow writers Stephen King and John Irving, J.K. revealed her thoughts about coming to the end of the series and the prospect of killing off certain characters. I, I understand why an author would kill a character from the point of view of not allowing others to continue writing after the original author is dead. Um, I don't always enjoy killing my characters. I didn't enjoy killing the character who died at the end of book six. I'm being discreet just in case anyone hasn't finished the book. <laughs> I really didn't enjoy doing that, but I had been planning that for years. So as, as John says, it wasn't quite as poignant as you might imagine. I'd already done my grieving when I actually came to write. For fans, it was devastating, but J.K. felt the satisfaction of a job well done when the final Harry Potter book hit the bookshelves on the 21st of July, 2007. Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows became the fastest selling book of all time, clocking up a staggering tally of 11 million copies in its first day of release in the UK and US. The end of the long journey proved emotional for the author. It was this amazing cathartic moment, the end of 17 years' work, and um, that was that was just hard to um, hard to deal with for about a week. And and it's very much tied into things that I've done in my life for 17 years, so it brought back a lot of memories of what had been going on in my life when I started writing. In 2007, the film version of Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix was released, directed by David Yates. J.K. continued to take a hands-on approach to the films and her involvement was much appreciated by the young actors. She's lovely, you know, Jo's just, she's wonderful, she's a great person to be around. And, um, you know, she, I mean, on one level you're sort of sitting there being really cool and sort of thinking, you know, we're just chatting because we know each other and the other part of you is going, she wrote the books. This is incredible, I'm talking to her. And the last one, the seventh, can you hear maybe two people die, what do you know? What do you mean, just tell something. I'm not going to tell you anything at all. Because each film is part of an ongoing series, the actors were occasionally privy to hush-hush information about later instalments. It was a heavy burden to bear. I, I went down to the set and Dan and I had a long chat and it was great, you know, we were, I was talking about the book and I, yeah, and I said to him, this is during the writing of House, and I said to him, uh, Dumbledore's giving me a bit of trouble, I thought I'd take a break for a day and come down and see, see you. And he said, but Dumbledore's dead. <laughs> and then he immediately said, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. And I panicked. And then, uh, then apparently, after I le left, he, he went uh, down the corridor to the other kids because they were still being schooled at the time. And he said, she told me, I know what happens. Well, of course, then he, then he was besieged and then he started to panic. And it's exactly like being me, so serves him right, you know. <laughs> when pressed about her future plans, JK admitted that a change of pace was called for. But I think... Probably I've done my fantasy. I think because Harry's world was so large and detailed and I've known it so well and I've lived in it for 17 years, it would be incredibly difficult to go out and create another world that didn't in some way, you know, overlap with Harry's or maybe borrow a little too much from Harry's. So I think fantasy-wise, I'm, I'm probably done. Ya volvemos con más. Icon. Por Glee. 